Hello and welcome to the show. Today on On Call, the first black woman to win the prestigious Booker Prize. Girl, Woman, Other has been translated into 41 languages and is now an international bestseller. It was her eighth book. The first was a collection of poems published in 1994 called Island of Abraham. The British Nigerian writer and activist's other works are now coming out in other languages. She's here in France for her 2008 book, Blonde Roots, which is out in French this February. Hello to Bernadine Evaristo. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Hello. Good it's, to be here. It's a pleasure to be here. It's your first time in Paris for 20 years, you it said. It is. When I arrived, I thought, I don't think I've been to Paris for a while. And then I looked it up and I realised it was 20 years. A lot's changed since then. And it's a gorgeous city. You're here to talk about a book that you wrote 15 years ago, before the Booker, um, before the Black Lives Matter movement. The world has changed immensely since then. Now, Blonde Roots is the fantastically imaginative inversion of um, the transatlantic slave trade in which whites were enslaved by black people. Do you think it will be received differently in 2023 to how it was received in 2008? I'm, I'm not sure, really, because I think it's a very challenging book because I, I reverse the history as we know it. So instead of Africans being enslaved, Europeans are enslaved. And it's also very, it's very provocative. It's very satirical. There's a lot of humour in it. And um, when it was published, it actually went down really well critically. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what happens with it in France. I have no idea. Now, as a writer, your project has been to explore um, the African diaspora, past, present, real, imagined, and from multiple perspectives. And when you began Girl, Woman, Other, um, your aim was to create a thousand black female characters. Um, is that really how lacking you felt um, <laughs> literature was of black female representation? Well, I was desperate at that stage because I thought, um, what if I put that many black women in a single novel? it will like start to make up for the imbalance where we're not really visible in British literature. And even, even today, I mean, it's getting better, but we're still not that visible in British literature. And then, of course, 1,000 women in a single novel is a ridiculous idea. <laughs> it would be 100,000, I don't know, pages. And so I then settled on 100, and I thought, oh, maybe that would be manageable. And then eventually it was 12, which is much more sensible. And we really get to know and, um, and love those characters. And you won the Booker at the age of 60 after mm. 40 years um, in the arts. You said that black women in their 50s and 60s, um, artists, novelists, actors, poets, um, are finally getting the recognition they deserve um, from the Venice Biennale to Bridgerton and the TV series that we're all, we're all loving and addicted to. Some people balk at these milestones, but you think it's important to celebrate them. Why? Oh, God, absolutely. Because I think we're living in a very kind of ageist culture where if you don't achieve big things or don't achieve your dreams when you're very young, people think you're past it and you'll never, you'll never get there. And when I think about, you know, winning the Booker at 60, having started in the early 80s, and I think about Adjua Ando, who's playing Lady Danbury in Bridgerton, who I know from the 80s. I think about Labena Himid, who won the Turner Prize, which is a huge visual art prize in the UK, when she was in her 60s. I also know her from the 80s. It's just incredible to think that society has shifted so much and we've stuck at it, that after literally decades upon decades upon decades, we're suddenly reaching a point where we're becoming incredibly well known and only because we never gave up. And how has that changed your life, the Booker Prize, winning it at 16? Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, my life is the same, like same husband, same friends, <laughs> same home, same job at Brunel University London. Uh, but on the other hand, my career has just gone through the roof. It has been the most incredible experience and I'm continuing to celebrate it because, as you said, like 41 languages for just girl, woman, other, and to have a readership of over a million people and uh, to just be afforded the kind of status that I didn't have before, but I wanted. <laughs> so it's so good to be taken very seriously as a writer. Uh, you've said that there's never been a better time in Britain for um, authors of colour, women of colour, um, to get published. Um, from an outsider's point of view, though, I'm obviously British, but I haven't lived there for a long time. The past years seem very chaotic. In, um, in Britain with Brexit, multiple changing prime ministers. What has the impact of all that been on arts and culture? Oh, well, you know, uh, it's, it's a bit of a, a mess, as you say, isn't it? Um, basically, you know, the arts is always struggling. 
financially, especially the subsidised arts. So you have the commercial arts, which doesn't really rely on public subsidy, and then you have subsidised arts. And certain governments are not always favourable to the subsidised arts. So I think like theatre has really struggled through COVID. Theatre, actually, performance arts have, start, have struggled through Brexit and the sort of EU laws. You know, where it's not so easy for people to come and work in Britain. It's not so easy for British artists to work in Europe and so on. Um, but in spite of all that, Certainly in terms of, you know, the ethnicity of writers in particular and also people in theatre and in film, I think we're having a bit of a golden period, which I, I really welcome. And it's 10 years um, since the Black Lives Matter movement started um, this year. Your work is now part of that movement, being the first black woman to win the Booker Prize. How much responsibility um, do you feel that you have as a female black writer? I have always felt a sense of responsibility, but at the same time, I also claim my individuality. So I've always been part of the sort of wider communities to which I belong. So like, you know, definitely the black British community, I feel very much part of that. And as an activist, I've initiated projects to develop um, poets of color, for example, as well as African poets. Um, so it's not a new thing for me. It's just that I have a bigger platform and my voice is amplified. But at the same time, I also claim my individuality. So. I write the things I want to write. Nobody tells me what to do. Last year, um, you published your memoir. Um, we've got it here. It's out in French as well this month, Manifesto on Never Giving Up, um, where you talk about your origin story and how you came to be where you are today, growing up in Woolwich in the 60s and 70s with a black father, a white mother. Um, both parents were political activists. Tell us how much influence did that have on who you are today? Yeah, I think, I think it, sort of, it was my sort of um, foundation, really as somebody who went into theatre originally and also writing, that I came from a family where if you believed that society wasn't fair, that it was unjust, that it was unequal, that you did something about it. You know, my parents went on demonstrations. My mother was a teacher, but she was also the trade union rep. My father was a shop steward. He was a labour councillor. You know, it was very much part of the fabric of my childhood. Although as a child, it's just normal. So I didn't think about that then. It's only later in life that I, I think about the fact that I became a writer who wanted to write stories about the African diaspora because they wasn't there. So it's the same kind of principle. Like, you want to see a change in society, so you start to make that change yourself. You don't wait for anyone else to do it for you. And growing up, did you experience a lot of racism um, coming from a family with a black dad and a white mum? Yeah, and it was, it was in the dark ages of the 60s and 70s, you know, before there was even a Race Equality Act. And certainly our house was used to be attacked by, by local youths who used to smash our windows in on a regular basis. Again, it was kind of normalised. It was just my childhood. My father was at the front line of hardcore racism. My, my experience was more, more subtle because I was, you know, I was British born, I was mixed race, so I was lighter skinned, um, but it was very much part of the society that I was growing up in. And you were invisible in that society because black people were not represented around you at all. You know, this is long before the Woman King film came out and uh, Wakanda Forever, where you just see these kick-ass black female characters dominating the stage in these global blockbusters, you know, Back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, we were so marginal, nobody was interested in us. You know, we, very few black people became models or worked in television or published books. It's a very different world we're living in today. So progress is being made. Definitely. Now, in your memoir, you discuss how motivational courses allowed you to um, overcome several challenges in your life and achieve your career goals. You manifested for the Booker Prize back in the 90s, yeah. um, apparently. Um, do you still have affirmations that you say even now that you're Definitely. sort of this successful? What are you manifesting for now? I don't really talk about what I'm manifesting, <laughs> but I was a little bit tired before I came on here. So I just did this visualisation to give me energy so that when I'm here, I can give 100%. But I use, I use um, creative visualisations, manifestations, aff right, affirmations all the time for all kinds of things for things that I want, for daily things in my life, to improve relationships. And how did you learn how to do that? I mean, what America. Did, what, what, America. <laughs> what did you say then to win the book? What was the actual affirmation that you oh, said to win so, the book of So an affirmation is positive, passionate, personal, present tense. So I wrote affirmations about having won the booker. Not that I wanted to win it. That it wasn't you were the winner. I won it. And that was in 1997 when my second book was published and it wasn't even eligible for the booker. And I had those affirmations. And when I won it, I remembered. I remembered those affirmations and dug them out. 
And then suddenly people were listening to me about this. They were like, <laughs> oh, maybe there's something in it. But I don't think I won it because of anything magical happening. I think it was because an affirmation is just creating a really positive mindset for yourself and going for what you want and, you know, being the voice you want to be in theatre, as in literature, in my case. And that's, that's what the affirmation did for me. And also somehow thinking that I was entitled to win the Booker Prize. And then the stars aligned and eventually I did win it. But I didn't win it because I, I, I wrote magic, the affirmation. It's a magic spell. Yeah, you know, it's, it's much more complicated than that. OK, well, congratulations. Thank you. We're so happy for you. We always end our show um, with, I guess, cultural pick of the moment. What have you chosen for us? So the Lehman Trilogy, which um, I know it's been around a while, but I saw it for the first time in London's West End on the opening night uh, last week. And it's this incredible play about the brothers who founded Lehman Bank, which, of course, was well, like intrinsic in the crash, the stock market crash of 2008, was it 2009? And it travels back to the 18th, 19th century and it's about how they built this bank and it is just a brilliant piece of theatre. OK, well, we look forward to that. We're going to leave you with a glimpse of the play, the Lehman Trilogy, on at London's West End at the Gillian Lynn Theatre until May. Benedine Everisto, thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to have you. Blonde Roots is out in French this February, published by Globe. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Your father and mine founded a bank. Responsible and respectable, a place you could trust. And you want to turn it into a club for financiers? Stocks are used by very few, whilst the bank is open to everyone. Why shut ourselves behind the door of Wall Street? The world is outside of the market, Philip. Quite the reverse, Herbert. The world is the market. Well, I have a problem with that. Revisiting the fight of Rute, the president of the Association of Peruvian Women subjected to forced sterilization in the 90s. We've been fighting for more than 25 years, and we will continue until we get the truth, justice and compensation. She listens. These are the results of all the medical exams I've had, because I've not been well since my tubes are tied. She supports. We need to be respected, because you're not alone. And above all, she does not give up. Now is the time to apologize. Watch Rute and her quest for justice in Revisited on France 24 and France24.com.